off by apologizing for the Zoom link mix up. Um, so sorry about that, but thank you guys for bearing with us. And luckily we had um, James and Louise working really fast and getting out the new Zoom link. Um, so yes, I, I just wanna remind everybody, um, if you're not speaking, just to keep your mic on mute. Um, our panelists will have, they, they can have their mics unmuted, but we just wanna remind you guys of that. So I just wanna start off by thanking each and every one of you for um, attending tonight. This is the first ever Criswell Women's, uh, Women's History Month panel. So we are just so excited for this. We've been praying for this event and just the conversation that we're having. Um, so yes, uh, I'm gonna ask James to open us in prayer before we get started. So James, would you lead us in prayer, please? Yeah, absolutely, Shay. And thank you, Shay, and your team for putting this together. Really grateful for you guys. Uh, wherever you are, if you'd like to join me in prayer, please. Father, thank you so much uh, for this time we have. Thank you so much for Criswell College, and thank you so much for uh, the community that we have and, and what you've blessed us with in that. And uh, Lord, thank you for our panelists, and thank you, thank you for Dr. Moore, for Bethany, uh, for Naomi, and for Shay. Lord, we thank you for uh, the incredible leaders that they are and, and what they mean to our community and ultimately, Lord, to your kingdom and to its work. Father, pray that you bless this discussion tonight. Um, and what we do with it after this. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your son. It's in Christ and by the spirit we pray. Amen. Thank you, James. All right, you guys, we have such a treat for you. Um, we have some of Criswell's best tonight. Um, I just feel honored to be up here with such powerful and amazing women. I'm so excited. So before we jump into the questions, I just want to ask each of um, our panelists to kind of give, um, just like, just to tell us briefly about themselves, um, what their role is at Criswell, just so we can kind of Good to know a little bit about them. So uh, Dr. Moore, we can start with you. Okay, um, well, so I am Dr. Moore. I am professor of New Testament here at Criswell. Um, I have, I guess this is my first uh, official semester as a full professor, but I've been an adjunct at Criswell for a few years. So I've seen a lot of you in my classes. Um, if I haven't, hopefully I will see you soon. Uh, I live in Arlington, Texas, I've got three kids, uh, two dogs, a cat I don't like, and a husband that I like a lot. So that's me. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Awesome. All right, Naomi. Well, hello, everyone. I think I recognize most, if not everybody in this. Um, so it's good to see everyone again. If you haven't seen my face at the front desk, I am one of the lovely front desk receptionists. And I'm also part of a few organizations on campus. Um, I'm vice president of the Student Government Association and president of uh, the Criswell Counseling and Psychology Association. Um, I'm also a psych student. I forgot about that. The whole reason why I came to <laughs> Criswell. Um, I am an international student from Kenya and I've grown up both in the United States and Kenya, um, but I'm currently in Allen, Texas and I graduate in May and also get married to Omar Rivera in May. So okay. exciting times. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you're not doing enough, Naomi. Anybody want to add anything else to my plate? Go ahead. Naomi's one of the best places to see in the morning. So if you've gotten to see her, it's a blessing. <laughs> Thank you, Naomi. All right. And last but not least, Miss Bethany Granger. Hey, everyone. Um, I uh, work on the third floor in academic affairs. And um, have been up there for about two years. Before that, I was working in student services for a while and worked with housing for a bit of time. Um, so some, some students who are maybe closer to graduating may remember when I was downstairs. Um, I have done both my bachelor's and my master's at Criswell. Um, and I recently got accepted into a doctoral program for New Testament studies. So um, that's the next adventure. I am married. I have no animals, um, mostly because I think that would be cruel, um, to have an animal in such a small apartment. And also I have lived at the library for most of my life and that's not conducive to having animals. So I wish I had them. Say lovey. Thank you, Bethany. Congratulations on your recent acceptance. That is so awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Once again, we're just so excited to have you all here. We just thank you for um, just giving us your time to just have this discussion about women's history. So with that, let's just go ahead and jump into our questions. Our first question of the night. Um, 
is what is a specific calling that God has placed over your life and how would you describe your role? How would you describe your role? So just whoever wants to answer first so we can go from there. Um, I guess I'll go first since we already established <laughs> Dr. Moore going first and they're not just staring at each other at the camera. Um, so a uh, specific call uh, when I was um, a senior in college, I, I was a chemistry major and um, I was headed to graduate school for chemistry and was really seeking kind of the Lord's guidance on my life and had um, a pretty kind of, I, I guess, spiritual experience where I felt like the Lord um, was telling me to go to seminary. And I said, but why? Um, what, why, why would I do that? I'm a chemistry major. Um, and I didn't really get a why. I just got to go. And so I started at seminary and um, another seminary, not Dallas seminary, but a different seminary. And I was uh, pretty unhappy and didn't feel like it was what I expected it to be. And I was like, well, I must have heard the Lord wrong. Um, and my husband said, OK, so wait, before you completely quit, uh, we had been married about a year at this point. He said, let's kind of analyze it. And we walked through and he was like, you always say you want to learn Greek. He's like, why don't you switch to a program? I, I wasn't in a program that focused on that. Um, he said, let's go see, um, maybe visit another seminary. And we visited Dallas Seminary. And I, um, that's how I kind of got into what was called academic ministries. Um, I felt like um, it really clicked for me, learning languages and theology. Um, and uh, really from that first Greek class on, if there's anybody in here that's had me for Greek, um, I really felt like um, that, uh, I, I just connected with it. It was, it was a feeling, it was um, um, just kind of a guidance of the spirit. And so uh, part of what I'm really passionate about is um, teaching people and leading people in understanding the New Testament better, um, understanding it in its original context, so that then they can apply that to their life and ministry today. So that's um, kind of my call and role in a short amount of time as I can tell that story. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. I can go next. Um, so I always want to clarify or nuance when we talk about calling. Um, because I think that there are different types of calling. I think there's broad calling uh, that God does to everyone to invite them to himself. I think there is um, calling that he has for all Christians that across the board, everyone should be responding to if they're a Christ follower. Um, and essentially that being you love God and you love others. Um, and then I think that there is specific calling to individuals' lives, which I think, Shay, is what your question is really getting at. But I think particularly for women, it's really important to recognize um, that calling doesn't just have to be for um, being a wife or being a mother. And I think from the traditions that maybe a lot of us are from, that is the message that we hear a whole lot growing up is like, we are called to be a wife or we are called to be a mother. Um, and I don't think either one of those is a woman's highest calling. Um, and so I just wanna just say all of those things caveat it to my actual story, uh, because I think it's important as we talk about calling for women um, that it maybe we need to expand what we mean by that or um, maybe what some of you have heard um, it being called before. So uh, no pun intended there with uh, saying called in that sentence. Um, but for me, I, so I grew up in a tradition that was uh, much more non-denominational and in high school felt a call to ministry and had absolutely no idea what that meant. Um, was interested in missions, um, loved school, had no clue what any of those things meant. Um, 
but just knew I wanted to know God better. And so I ended up at Criswell right out of high school. And similarly uh, to Dr. Moore, I took a Greek course and absolutely fell in love with the language, Um, which is kind of ironic to me because I actually started at Criswell wanting to try and get out with as little foreign language as humanly possible. Um, And then I ended up like doing a whole minor in biblical languages. So be careful what you think you're going to get out of that maybe it's exactly what God wants you to be doing. But that's another whole conversation. Um, So I just kept kind of walking through my undergraduate degree, walking through my master's um, and, and felt kind of along that way that theological education is where God wanted me to be. Um, And so um, I eventually then got a position in administration and have been able to do that side of theological education, Um, but eventually would love to be in the classroom teaching. And honestly, I think that um, for places like Criswell, the thing that I see um, that was really, I think, the need that I, I felt as a student and also wanted to fill and felt called to was that we need mothers in the faith, um, helping us talk through uh, the things that we're learning. Um, and so that's who I feel I'm called to be. Thank you, Bethany. I really appreciate your distinction in the beginning just um, of what a calling could be to each of us and um, just really signifying that as women, we don't have to kind of go with the calls of what culture says, but that we can be called to so much more. So um, I just really appreciate that. Thank you, Um, Naomi. Um, Yeah, so similar to what Bethany was saying, I felt that in high school, towards the end of my high school career, I guess, and then moving on into college, I felt a calling to somehow listen and then share stories. And when I first graduated, I thought that what God meant by that was going into journalism. So I graduated with the intention of going into college and pursuing a communications degree or a photojournalism degree and not getting anywhere close to counseling and psychology because that's what my dad did. And I wasn't going to touch that. God works in crazy ways, though. Um, And then halfway through my freshman or sophomore year, the Lord just said, that's, that's not where I, I have you. And I realized that I did have a passion for trying to understand what it means to be in a system that caters and, and tries to help with mental health care. Um, and I felt that that was where I could be best equipped in um, listening to people's stories and, sh- and, and walking through people's stories with them and then sharing those stories. So um, that is, I, I don't know exactly what trajectory the Lord has for me in that calling. I'm still in the process of, of, of learning and growing in that. And I mean, I feel that lots of people even later on can say the same thing, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're still working through it. And then in terms of my role, I guess where I am right now, I feel that God has just called me to serve in the best way I can. And I think that that has shown up in ways that I didn't expect, like being a student leader, but serving in those ways um, and serving in ways that doesn't mean that I'm a background character and in ways that I'm not just um, in a, a part of something that nobody sees me, which has made things a little bit difficult. But um, in terms of that, and we're walking through that in terms of what that means, pursuing a counseling degree and pursuing a counseling career. So uh, I think that's where I'm at right now, um, in terms of my calling and my role. So we'll see where the Lord takes that. Thank you, Naomi. Um, I loved how you talked about um, storytelling from a counseling point of view. I've never thought of it like that, this, um, the storytelling in psychology. So thank you. Um, I love that. So just to kind of um, piggyback off of that question, um, our next question is how has as well or the church or any other area um, that you are involved in, how have they cultivate, cultivated your gifts to be the most useful?
Am I going first again? <laughs> um, you don't have to. I'll go first. Go ahead, Bethany. <laughs> so um, I think what came to mind as I was thinking about this question was um, that uh, I'll answer it in two ways. One is a Criswell story and one is a church related story. So at Criswell, I have had the opportunity to grade uh, for a lot of professors throughout the years. Um, and that has been really formative for me, being able to work directly with professors since um, that's always been the trajectory that I felt like I've been on. And so learning kind of the back end of being a professor, what is it like to create a syllabus? What is it like to grade papers? What is it like to um, deal with student issues or um, help students get through a semester? Or how do you help students learn specific elements that they, you need to teach through the class, whether that's through a paper or whether that's quizzes or whatever it may be? Um, and I think, um, so, th so that's like a real, like, you know, on the ground, getting experience, doing those types of things. But I think one of the things that's been the most helpful there is the relationships that I've built with some of the professors at Criswell that have just poured into my life and have seen the giftings that God gave me and called them out of me and encouraged me in those things. And, um, and I think that uh, kind of back to the question of calling, I think that it's important um, that when we're talking about calling that other people in the community also acknowledge that gifting in your life as well and call it out of you um, and encourage you towards it because there may be things that you're not even thinking about doing. Um, and, and someone in the community is like, hey, do you realize that God made you in such a way that you'd be really good at this thing? Um, and so, uh, that's kind of my Criswell story. Um, and I have lots of fun little stories about some of your professors that you may have never heard before. Um, the other story that I have is related to a church congregation that I was a part of, um, that we're not a part of now, but we were for the first couple of years of our marriage. And, um, and that was just having, um, a really supportive pastor who uh, also was a Criswell grad, but had planted this church and knew us really well, married us. Um, and the way that he was able to facilitate uh, the giftings that I had in our local church was really special for me. Um, so for example, um, he let me help write my own wedding sermon um, because I was like, hey, this is the text that I want you to preach. And he was like, cool. Uh, that's a, a text that uh, is not normally preached at a wedding. And I was like, exactly, we're going to go there. Um, and um, so that was really supportive. He also pushed me into leadership roles in our church. So encouraged me to be on our bylaws committee review, um, encouraged me to lead home groups. Um, and so I think, uh, just in our local church context, that was really beneficial to have, um, our senior pastor and some of our elders pushing me towards utilizing the skills that I'd learned at Criswell and the gifts that God had given me in our local community. Well, thank you, Bethany. That's such a beautiful thing when people from our community are able to bring some of the gifts, like you said, that we don't even notice to light. Um, that's just so encouraging. And just for the way that um, your previous pastor was able to pour into your life. I love that. Dr. Moore, did you want to speak now? Would you remind repeating the question? <laughs> no problem. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of a long <laughs> How has Criswell, the church, or any other area of involvement cultivated your gifts to be the most useful? Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for repeating that. Dr. Moore maybe has a, a short attention span this at uh, this time of night. Um, so uh, I have very similar stories to Bethany, uh, just at different institutions. Um, I got my master's degree and my PhD uh, from Dallas Seminary. Um, and so I just remember, you know, little things like uh, professors commenting on a paper, um, you should really think about getting your PhD, and me going, what? I, I, what is that? Uh, really? 
Um, and so uh, I think you can just never really know what a little comment uh, is, like Bethany said, uh, affirming and calling out somebody else's giftedness um, and leadership. Uh, and I think especially women, I was just having this conversation in my uh, 445 class. Um, sometimes we just, um, uh, we need somebody to, to remind us or point out, uh, especially if you see leadership um, uh, skills or gifting um, in women that you know or that are in your realm of influence uh, for you young men out there listening. Um, point it, or or a woman, other women, uh, point it out. Be like, hey man, I, I I really think you're doing great at this. Um, maybe you could think about dreaming about uh, doing something like this. So a lot of encouragement just from a lot of my professors. Um, but so as an older woman, <laughs> um, um, also just the respect of colleagues um, is, is really encouraging. Um, and so that can look like a lot of things. Um, that can look like a colleague coming to me and saying, hey, have you read this book? What do you think about this? Or how do you translate this? Can you translate this passage for me and help me walk through it? Um, so um, colleagues just being really supportive, um, treating you with respect, but also um, coming to you, you know, for your expertise, you know, once you, once you gain some expertise. Um, and church, uh, really similar experiences to Bethany. Uh, uh, my pastor is often, you know, just uh, publicly praising me, um, saying he's proud of me. You know, he's um, that 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 kind of somebody being proud of you. That that feels good, right? It fills your cup. Um, uh, but also um, coming to me and asking me to um, uh, help him think through issues um, or um, lead, you know, classes or things like that. Uh, so yeah, just anybody. Um, Anytime anybody has just pointed out and said, hey, um, I, think, I think you're really good at this, or um, I, I think you could do this, is, has been a helpful, um, empowering, and encouraging experience in lots of different places, so. That's awesome. Yeah, um, just people asking, like, and trust, trusting you with, like, something like walking them through a passage. That says a lot without saying a lot, definitely. Thank you. All right, so our next question. Uh, this says, what are some of your experiences being a woman in your field? So with Dr. Moore, a theology professor with Bethany, we have her in a leadership position. And Naomi, we have a student leader in our student body. Um, and then just to add on to that question about your experiences, what are some victories that you've experienced? And then what are also some challenges or hardships that you've experienced? Naomi, would you like to answer that last question we had? Yes. Oh, um, well, it kind of it kind of ties similarly with this question. Um, but being a student leader, especially, has been interesting because this was never anything that I ever planned for in terms of being a college student. Uh, when, I, especially when I first started at Crizzle, I had every intention to fly under the radar and get my degree as quickly and as quietly as possible with <laughs> no, no one noticing me or paying attention to me. And it took other students and professors um, seeing these capabilities and giftings that I did not know I had. And it was the Lord showing them that through, th through their encouragement and their um, constant reaffirming of these giftings that um, I was able to even just take a step forward before I even saw it in myself. I figured, you know, I might as well try it. And I ended up um, in SGA and all and Kappa and all of these different things. Um, but in terms of the question that you asked about being a woman in this field, um, it, it has been interesting because in higher education, I faced both the expect different levels and variations of expectations of expecting the most that I needed to achieve and succeed as much as possible. Um, and on the flip side, not expecting much of me at all. And that came externally and internally with the expectation that if I fail to succeed and achieve in these high ways, that that was okay because I could always rely on somebody else to, um, to I guess, be okay 
whether that be, you know, my parents or getting married and having a husband or something like that. Um, or I needed to become a professor so that I could prove myself and my worth as a woman outside of marriage and family. And both ends of those spectrums are, I mean, the, the Lord sees worth in both of them and he has value in both of them, but I had either very high expectations or no expectations at all. And that was a struggle and it still is a struggle. So it's been a very difficult, but good experience to be a student leader at Criswell and then being, um, in some sort of position at my church, outside of church. And I uh, like at my church, I serve on the welcome team and I use my skills as a receptionist to kind of, you know, good morning, how are you? All that stuff. Um, but um, it's, it's really pushed me in ways that I never expected. And it's been difficult, but I feel that the Lord had a purpose in all of that, especially when I fought at every step whenever I didn't want to do what the Lord was calling me to do because he saw he has he had giftings for me that I couldn't see myself but others did or that others expect didn't expect of me and didn't want me to pursue but the Lord did and therefore created pathways and pushed me to do that um it was it was difficult but it's been a blessing so far and um I would just encourage my peers and anybody who's um, struggling with the, those kinds of things of affirmation and trying to figure out where the Lord has them, that even though it may take a while and the journey may be difficult, the Lord does have purpose for, for you and where the trajectory goes doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to look like somebody else's or what you thought, but there is still value and purpose in that trajectory. And um, there's going to be moments where it feels like you're going backwards. There's going to be moments where you feel like it doesn't make sense. Um, and that's still okay. Uh, and I feel like that's going to be the rest of my life where I just, I may not have any idea where I'm going, but um, I mean, as long as the Lord's there in it let's go, you know? So, yeah. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Naomi. All right, Bethany, I guess I'll go first on this one. <laughs> I like it when Bethany goes first and then I can just kind of cheat off of her um, answers. Uh, so uh, I guess the, the, the first question was, um, what is it like to be a woman in your field? Um, and so um, that's a big question. Um, I, I kind of started this work uh, 10 to 15 years ago and um, being a woman in New Testament studies uh, was and is often kind of lonely to be honest. Um, uh, it's, it's still very much a male dominated field um, and that's changing, obviously. Got Bethany coming behind me, um, uh, joining uh, the crew. Um, but you know, we're I'm a just the cavalry, right? Um, and so, um, there are a lot of times when I've walked into a room, whether it was a PhD class or a conference, um, or a class I was teaching and been unsure if everybody in the room wanted me there or thought I should be there. Um, there was one PhD class um, that I walked into and the professor asked me multiple times if I was sure I was in that class. <laughs> and, um, and, but there have been other times when I've been in a PhD class when the professor um, announced to the whole class that he was excited that I was there and that there was a woman in the room. So um, there have been uh, both positive and difficult things. Um, that the conferences, the academic conferences that New Testament professors and other professors go to um, are often difficult. Um, uh, people have asked, uh, when my husband goes with me, they ask um, what he teaches. And he says, um, I, I teach law. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I'm, I'm just here with my wife. Um, 
or people just assuming that um, that you're not uh, who you are, assuming uh, because you're a woman, you're probably not a, a PhD in New Testament. Um, and so that that's hard. Um, that, that's a hard place to walk into. Um, but um, uh, I do think that that's changing a bit. Um, our evangelical conferences are, are, are becoming more diverse. Um, and as more women and, and other uh, minorities come into the fold, and so that's getting a little bit better. Um, like I say, um, the respect of colleagues um, helps with that, right? Um, when I'm at a conference and male colleagues realize, oh yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Moore or Terry might not have anybody to go to dinner with, and they invite me to dinner with them, um, and things like that. So including me on social outings and, and those types of things. Um, I'm, you know, multiple times I've been, you know, the first female professor uh, at DTS in the New Testament department. And um, so sometimes that being the first and being the only then puts um, undue pressure on me, right? Because then I go, oh, if I fail, they're gonna think every woman's gonna fail. They're never gonna hire another woman in the world. Um, and so I want to release any of you other women listening to this, I want to release you from that pressure. That's not true. I mean, that's something we, we place on ourselves. Um, so if, you know, if, if, I, if I fail, I'm not ruining it for every other woman in the world, right? Um, and so that, that's some pressure that we put on ourselves when we're in those positions. Um, but, um, I, you know, I think there's uh, hard things that we don't want to deny, um, but I will say there's really positive things too. Um, when I was um, going through um, kind of a job process at the same time, another female friend of mine was going through a job process at a secular school. Um, she got way more questions, inappropriate questions, <laughs> about um, her gender and whether motherhood would interfere with her work um, than I have ever gotten at any conservative evangelical Christian um, school. Um, I got my PhD and adopted three children throughout the process and was always given uh, as much maternity leave as I needed. Like there, you know, that, that type of support um, for me to be able to accomplish goals um, at home and at work has always been there for me. And so um, that's a really positive thing, I think, um, in, in our field and I think in our circles that that type of support, um, I think for both moms and dads to um, recognizing the importance of that and, and how we all wanna balance our careers um, and our studies and our ministry with that. So that's been a really positive thing. So. I, again, I've forgotten what all the questions are, so I hope I answered them in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> no, you definitely did. Thank you, Dr. Moore. So I feel like Terry and I are just broken records because I'm like, hey, her experience was my experience, and you know, whoever goes first gets to share it. Um, but uh, I, I will also say, um, uh, being a woman in theological education has been a lonely experience um, and for, for a bunch of different reasons. Um, I used to, um, in, when I was in undergrad, kind of the ratio in my head was, there was probably every one girl for every five guys. Um, and and um, the further I got in my biblical studies degree and the higher, uh, higher core, higher level courses I took in biblical studies, the more that ratio uh, got broader, um, where there were often times where I was the only woman in the room. Um, and I, I agree with Dr. Moore that um, what that means is it puts a lot of pressure on the women who are in the room um, for in a, d a bunch of different ways. One, you know, you want to be a good representation and, and not tank the ship for everyone behind you. Um, but also I think it, it means you have to bear the brunt of all the questions that everybody wants to ask the woman. You have to be the perspective of all the women around you. And I am not the expert on all of 
womankind um, or our perspectives. Um, and so that can be exhausting. If, I, if I'm being honest, it can be exhausting to uh, be the go-to person to answer the same question every single time. Um, or if we're talking about, you know, women's roles in the church or something, immediately, if you're the only woman in the room, they all kind of eyeball you and go, hmm, I wonder what you think. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the experiences that I've had as a student um, I will say being a staff member uh, in administration has been um, honestly delightful in a lot of ways. I have gotten the privilege to work with a lot of incredible people. And um, I, I don't think that that is everywhere in higher education, um, certainly not. But um, I have gotten the privilege to get to work with just some incredible, at this point, faculty members, since I, I work directly for Dr. Graham at this point, I work a lot with uh, program directors. And so it's really fun to get to be peers with people who I, I'm not technically a peer with um, because I'm not teaching, I don't have a doctorate yet. And so it's been fun to be a part of a different side of the academy than um, just teaching in the classroom. Um, what have been, so I've got the questions here in front of me and I see what have been some victories, what have been some challenges. So, um, I think it has been, I think one of the challenges is that you have to have a lot of grit and you have to have a lot of stamina, uh, to be a woman who wants to be in theological spaces. Um, because you're constantly told you should not be. Um, particularly, I think maybe in our swath of Christianity. And um, one of those negative experiences that I had, I actually was filling in for a professor, this was years ago, and he had not told the class that I was filling in for him. And I, um, and it was a Greek course and I came in to start getting ready to teach that day. And there was a couple students, you know, it's a couple minutes before class. And um, one of the students uh, looked at me, saw that I was behind the podium and said, hey, are you teaching today? Is so-and-so out? And I said, yeah, so-and-so is out. Uh, he's, he's asked me to fill in. And um, the student who happened to be a man promptly closed all his books, packed up his bag and walked out of the room. Um, and to be fully charitable, he could have gotten a very urgent text message. Um, it could be that he had decided to leave and it didn't matter who was filling in for this professor. Cause you know, we all have that inclination when it's not the, the normal professor to not wanna be there when there's a sub. Um, but I will say in the moment, it was really, really, really hard not to believe that it was because I was a woman teaching Greek and teaching New Testament that he didn't wanna be in the room. Um, and that is just one experience that I think being a woman in theological spaces uh, is an experience we have to bear the burden of. Um, and that's a difficult experience that requires a lot of stamina and grit. Um, part of what that means is um, it makes me really, really want to know uh, what I'm studying and be really good at what I'm doing so that there is no other excuse um, to be ignored or be silenced. Um, and so, uh, I think that's actually been like a weirdly positive thing about this, because if there aren't very many women in the room, um, it, it forces you to do the hard work of being really good at what you're learning and, and um, what you're studying, which I think is only a positive thing. Um, there is no skating by for us as women in theological education. You either, uh, if you skate by, you probably just drop out because it's very difficult. Um, and if you, if you stick in it, it probably means um, there's something really important for you to do in that work. And so um, I, I share that 
kind of terrible experience. Um, just to say this, first off, if you're a guy, you should never do that to anyone ever. Or if you're a girl, you should never do that to anyone ever. You should just never walk out on a class. You should just always sit there. You should listen to whoever's, whoever's lecturing. You should, just, you should just learn from them. Side note. But secondly, um, I, um, I, I want to say that to say um, stamina is something that you have to build up. Um, and, um, it doesn't come overnight and it's not easy. And so I would just encourage, uh, any students, particularly female students right now, who are maybe feeling really tired. Um, maybe you're really struggling in your courses. Um, maybe you're at the end of your first year or your second year and you're feeling very lonely. Um, and I would just encourage you that there are other women around you who are probably experiencing the same thing and they're probably not talking about it. Um, and I would just, I would reach out to them, ask, ask for what you need, ask for help from professors, ask for help from female staff members or fellow students, um, because you're not alone in this experience, even though it may feel like you are. Bethany, thank you so much for that. Um, as a woman going to school for Christian ministry, that encourages me like more than you will ever know. Um, you know, after getting the question, oh, so you want to you want to do uh, children's ministry? Um, there's definitely a kind of stamina that's built from that, um, and just you know, the being knocked down, but being like, no, like Lord, I want to learn even more now, um, and just the um, encouragement that can come from that. So thank you. Um, and just to kind of start summing things up, this is kind of a question for our listeners that are on here right now, and it's how. How can our brothers in Christ help to love and value the women that serve alongside them well? So just for everybody to kind of take away something more from this specifically for some of our um, male listeners. We're all looking at each other again. Bethany, you want to go first this time? Sure. Or, um, or Naomi, you can go first too, Naomi. Yeah, Naomi, go for it. All right, since I've been volunteered. <laughs> um, so when I was thinking about this question, um, I, I definitely did ask my brother for some insight into, um, because we also have this question because we're people of color. So I kind of paralleled my response to how I, I would answer a question about ethnicity and race and culture and things like that. Um, and I would firstly say, um, listening is a big one, but that not, not stopping at listening. It takes um, pursuing and acting on what it is that you are learning from women around you and about women around you. So um, not assuming that they will be your sources of information about a topic that has to do with women or just anything, but specifically about women in the church or what women's roles are or something about women in the Bible or anything like that. Um, being proactive in, in learning and understanding what it means to take on uh, what women do and, and uh, what taking on um, positions in, let's say, theology or um, academics or anything really as a woman. Um, reading up books about women in the church, there are so many that people don't talk about enough. Um, reading books on any perspective by a woman, um, listening to resources, and, and going out and doing the work to find those resources without asking women every single time. Because again, that is a burden that can weigh a lot heavier than you think, um, especially in the sphere that we are in at a school that teaches theology and is a Christian school. Um, whenever it comes to those passages about women in the Bible and then everybody turning and looking at the only female in the class, just by looking at her and assuming that she's going to explain everything that has to do, puts a tremendous burden on on us that some of us never asked for or are incapable of taking on but all of a sudden it feels like we need to know everything about 
what it means to be a woman in the Bible or in theology or in academics or in psychology or in anything. And a lot of times it can, over time or all at once, crush someone's spirit. It can um, cause a lot of insecurity. It can just bring about a lot of things that make it difficult to interact with those things. Like every time I can sense that a passage is coming up in church about women in leadership, I can already feel myself getting antsy because I'm like, somebody's going to be like, so what did you think about that? You know, or something like that. And it just, it's hard, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, sometimes I don't know how to answer. And for a lot of times I refuse to be in any coffee shop conversations about anything from theology classes because I would hear them starting up and I would walk away because either I would be completely ignored and it doesn't matter what I say, or everyone would look to me to explain a female perspective and I would feel like I am not well equipped in that. So I would draw myself back. So I would ask our brothers to pursue an understanding and a knowledge and listen and seek to hear the women in your life, but not put the entire burden of your understanding on them. Yeah, I'd leave it at that. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Thank you, Naomi. Um, just educating yourselves and not only educating yourself through one source, there's so many sources. Um, so just really spreading your horizon of sources. Thank you. Bethany. Um, so one thing I would say, I've got a lot, so bear with me as I walk through the list in my brain. Um, so one thing I would say that has been specifically encouraging for me is uh, when I have had, um, when I have been in a situation, we've got in a situation then completes itself and we go on with our day and that somebody else who was in the room uh, comes back to me and says, hey, I just want to check in on you. I recognize that the conversation that we may have just had or that you were in the room for or something may have been difficult for whatever reason. Um, and I just want to make sure that you're all right. Um, now, first off, it takes you actually knowing that person. I wouldn't just do that to some random person you don't have a relationship with already. Um, but if you have a decent relationship with, I mean, I mean, I'm specifically thinking of coworkers that I know um, I don't know that I would say like, we're the best of friends or something, but like we work together and they have had the awareness to know that a situation may have either been difficult for me, um, triggering for me, um, whatever word you want to use. And so I would say, um, having social awareness of what's happening and how that's affecting somebody in the room is really, really important because they may never say anything. Um, they may never show it on their face, but it may have hit them really hard that day. Um, so that's one thing I would say. I think another thing I would say is if uh, you are in some position of authority, and I would say that most people are, even if they don't recognize it, but maybe you have a job where you are over other people, um, or maybe you have positions at church or whatever it may be, you're probably in some level of authority somewhere and utilizing your platform to elevate the women around you um, is really, really huge. Um, and uh, I think that's been something that's meant a whole lot to me because then it is someone above me extending their hand and saying, hey, come on. Um, and I've seen that happen countless times um, as you know, I'm just thinking of people at Criswell who maybe were over me, um, whether in a staff position or a faculty position, and they opened up an opportunity for me that I would not have had based on where I am currently. And so I would just say, um, since we're talking specifically to, to maybe the men who are listening, um, what are areas in which you can offer space for women in your lives to be able to utilize their leadership abilities, 
their giftings, whatever that may look like. Um, specifically for me, um, some real tangible examples have been um, faculty members have given me classroom time. They've allowed me to teach in their classes. They've um, encouraged me to come in and sub in for them. Um, they have placed me, um, administrators have placed me on committees where my voice was able to impact things that were happening in the college community. Um, and that's a whole other leadership uh, realm. Um, maybe they have given me responsibilities They've given me projects to do and they aren't micromanaging me. I think that's another way that you can elevate the women around you by trusting them. First off, giving them something to do and trusting that they'll do it. Um, and then if they have questions on how to do it or they need help, that's another thing that you could come in and assist with. But um, giving them responsibility, giving them ownership of things, I think would be really important. Um, and then, um, I, I would just say um, a, a third way that I can think of is um, there are times where we just are tired of having certain conversations. And I think everyone probably knows what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about like women, women's leadership roles in the church or whatever it may be. Um, I guarantee you, we have had that conversation ad nauseum and we are exhausted. And so it would be nice if, um, if when you hear that kind of conversation coming up, or maybe you have friends who want to dialogue around that, um, maybe you, you bear that burden for us so we don't have to have that conversation for like the 600th time. Um, so, um, so that's another thing I would say. And then fourthly, since I keep thinking of things, um, I would say uh, it really goes miles to actually encourage us with words, <laughs> um, to actually use your words and say, hey, really well done, or hey, I see this thing in you, continue to do it. And just the encouragement to continue pursuing what we feel like God's called us to, because just like anyone, we have dark days, we have hard days, uh, life is still ravaged by sin, and so we still struggle. Um, and so uh, coming alongside us and just making sure that, um, you know that you see us in our struggle and, and just helping us along with it. So, all right, Terry. Uh, so uh, what Bethany and Naomi have said is, is great. Um, uh, I think just uh, a lot of times when I speak to um, my male colleagues about this issue, they don't really know um, how exhausting uh, uh, existing in these spaces can be for us. So um, know that we're not trying to make you feel bad. We're just trying to help you understand kind of what our life is like so that you can walk alongside us. Um, like uh, Shay um, worded the question as our brothers. Um, so um, one thing that I have noticed as a professor at Criswell is um, I see you guys interacting with your female uh, fellow students in really positive ways, um, uh, including them in your conversations during breaks about um, whatever theology we've just discussed, um, respecting um, their thoughts um, on theology or the New Testament, um, and engaging um, your female colleagues in that sort of uh, equal peer type way. Um, that's been really encouraging as a professor, professor to see those sorts of relationships um, and, and see you guys already um, getting ready to co-lead well as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I see that um, uh, as a really positive thing. Um, so here's, here's my big thing um, that I um, would ask of probably any man that I stand in front of. Um, we need you to have a zero tolerance policy um, for misogyny or abuse of any kind. Um, off color jokes, we need you to say, nope, that's not how we're gonna talk about women when I'm in the room. Um, um, and we need you to do that out loud. And we need you to do that when it's gonna cost you something, right? Um, so there's there's no such thing as locker room talk, right? Um, uh, for, for people of the way of Jesus. Um, there's no such thing as saying, well, that's just kind of how men talk when they're around each other. Absolutely not. No, 
uh, not allowed. Um, and we need you to kind of step in when you see that happening. Um, but also, um, you know, the, the issue of abuse has come up in Southern Baptist churches over the past several years. Um, and it's been really troubling to see uh, how it's been handled um, when, um, when it comes up that, that something inappropriate has happened and something abusive has happened. Um, and so anytime I have an audience of young men and women who are going to end up leading the church, I, I want to have this conversation to say, uh, if, if abuse isn't something that we can look in the eye and say, nope, not on my watch, then burn it all down. What are we doing? Um, so, um, uh, and, and so I, I think as a new generation, I think you can come in and I think you can create a culture um, uh, that doesn't allow that anymore. Um, and so that's going to take several things. And some of the books that um, Shay uh, had us um, send to you guys, uh, some of the books I sent, um, you're going to have to kind of educate yourself on um, what abuse looks like because it's it's slippery and it's sly and people who abuse sneak in and they convince you that they're not who, who they really are. Um, and then you're going to have to realize that um, sometimes um, our heroes uh, end up being the ones that we need to address in this issue. Um, and so um, realizing that probably sometime in your life, maybe somebody's going to come to you with an accusation of somebody that you really love and you really think a lot of, and you need to listen and you need to go through the process of, of getting the right people involved to deal with it. So um, yeah, uh, that's kind of what I always, I always tell people kind of uh, anytime they meet me, if something like that comes up, I just, I say it, I'm like zero tolerance policy. That's my personal policy. If you're going to talk like that, then you're going to have to uh, not be around me. So uh, that's one of the big things we need uh, from you guys. But yeah, I mean, we're, um, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, like we're a family. Um, and so a lot of these things um, uh, that come up in church, churches or institutions are um, when women are are not treated like adults. Um, can I can I say that? Um, sometimes um, sometimes uh, we're not treated as equals, and and that means you know our opinions aren't as valued, or we're immediately kind of suspect or things like that. Or like others have said, sometimes we're ignored because um, it's just too difficult to figure out what to do with this. Uh, but I think especially women. Um, who um, are in theology or things like that, it really is easier sometimes to ignore us because you're like, wait, but my theology says they can't do this. And so what do I do with them? Well, figure it out. You know, I mean, um, uh, don't just ignore us and, and, and think we're going to go away. Um, but I really do. I want to then end on that positive note. Um, I've seen really a lot of great positive interactions at Criswell. Um, but if you're a young man and you see something that's not a positive interaction, um, uh, and you don't feel like confronting that other student, um, then come talk to professors or, um, uh, or deans or anything like that so that we can help address anything inappropriate that we see uh, happening on campus. So, uh, and that's, that's it. And I actually, I wanna follow up on something yeah. that Dr. Moore just said. Um, it's okay to ask and be curious about how we experience something. Um, and so if you, you know, if, if you encounter an experience and you're like, hmm, I'm really curious how Bethany thought about this thing that just happened that she was a part of, um, ask and be curious about that. I think that's a really, um, a, a, that's such a valuable thing where you, that's a way that you can demonstrate that you are caring and you are valuing us uh, by being curious about how do we experience something. Now, I will say, uh, when you ask those types of questions, you have to actually be open and honest about actually asking and wanting to hear what we have to say. Um, because what we may say may surprise you and it, it might hurt your feelings. It might be something difficult for you to hear. And so um, recognize that when you ask, you've got to be um, 
you got to be compassionate within, within that. You've got to be charitable in asking that question and being able to sit with maybe some hard answers. Um, but I would also say, just don't be afraid to ask. Um, particularly if you're like, Hey, I, I, you know, I was, you know, I was in this conversation and like Bethany was there too. And I, I don't know if she's okay. And I want to ask if she's okay, but I'm not sure if that was even awkward for her. Um, it's all right to be like, Hey, so this thing happened. Love to get your thoughts. The floor is open. Um, and I think, um, and that's also just a way of learning. How do we experience, uh, different things, um, as women in these spaces that maybe are different than a man's experience in these spaces. Mm, thank you guys. And I just thank you for your challenge to our brothers. Um, if we want to get better at this, it's gonna be hard sometimes. It's gonna be difficult. We're gonna have really difficult conversations, but um, we are pushing to get better. So I thank you guys so much for this. Um, as Dr. Moore mentioned, I have attached a book list um, from our panelists and also from some extra friends, just of different resources that could be helpful in educating yourself on resources that could, um, just about women's, you know, it's, it's a great list. You need to check it out. We're actually going to be doing a giveaway tonight. Um, there's just such a great variety of books on there. I feel like I can't sum it up in one sentence, um, but we're going to be doing a book giveaway. The book that we're giving away is called Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church by Diane Landberg. So we're gonna be giving that book away. And uh, President Mayville did a drawing for us and our winner for the night is going to be Emily Rigsby. So we will have, <laughs> we will have that book sent. Um, but just once again, we just wanna thank you guys so much for being on here. Um, Dr. Moore, Naomi, uh, Bethany, we just thank you so much just for your insight and your wisdom on this topic. Um, and everybody who has joined us tonight, Right. Thanks so much. We are going to be doing a recap video and it's going to have the book list on there as well. So um, if you, you can share this with your friends, if they weren't able to make it or family, because it is a conversation that we're needing to have right now. Um, and we just really value the importance of that. So um, once again, I thank you guys so much and I'm thankful for what the Lord has done tonight. And I just pray that um, this conversation would stay on your mind and heart and that it just wouldn't be an hour of our night tonight, but that it would be brought to fruition in the future. So thank you so much. Um, we love you all, and we hope that you have a great rest of your night. Thank you.